I'm so honored to be here. And I, anytime I give a talk, I like to open up with really what the intention is. And so for me today, the intention is to get all of you really comfortable with marketing and, and to have you walk away feeling like you could really be in control of, of your own marketing. Uh, so I want to give you a little background about how I started. Uh, I started my company, Buzz Marketing Group, when I was 16. And it's been 22 years now. And I never thought I'd be a marketer. I really wanted to be a fashion editor. And at 16, 15 rather, I, I took a job with a newspaper writing product reviews. It was called the New Girl Times. And every time I would send a company a review, they would say, if I send you more product, will you tell me what you think? And so I thought I had landed the dream job of just testing products and telling companies what I thought about them. Um, and that continued for a couple years until a client, and I use air quotes because they were just people who sent me product, um, told me that the research I had done with my friends was better than something she'd paid $25,000 for and that I had a business and it was in market research and I should figure it out. And happened to be a freshman in college and went to the head of the business department and we talked, I took an independent study and, and really started to build out the company. Uh, and then in 2000, Cosmo Girl wrote about what we were doing. Uh, it was literally two sentences in a magazine that got us 15,000 applications from people all over the world who wanted to be buzz spotters, and that's what we call our trend spotters. Um, fast forward to today, we have 40,000 people in our research network, uh, and we've served over 165 companies, and this is just a few of our clients. And so, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to go into organizations and, and normally work with C-suite executives and really talk to them about the major problem that they're having. And I like to say a lot of my work is the problem that keeps the CEO or CMO up at night. Uh, it's the one they whisper about and the one they say, we've got to figure out a solution to this, or I don't know what's going to happen with the company, or we need to make a pivot. And you know, I think we're, we're in a really interesting time right now where we're watching really big companies uh, grapple with really big problems. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of new, emerging, smaller companies that you know, are digitally native or direct to consumer who are opening up really big marketing opportunities. And so, so it's a really interesting time to be a marketer for sure. Um, okay, this one didn't translate. Uh, so on this slide, uh, I also wanted to talk about it, another part of our business. So um, we coin a lot of trends and a lot of different words. And so I just want to give you an example of a few of, of the trends we've coined over the years. And so. Uh, I think the one that put me on the map years ago was this idea called Warholism. And so about 10 years ago, we identified that, you know, if you know the fam famous Andy Warhol quote, he says, you know, in the future, everyone will have their 15 minutes of fame. And so as a marketer, that really took on a different meaning, right? I, I grew up in the 90s where the only way a real person could ever be on TV was to be one of seven strangers picked to live in the house on MTV's The Real World, right? That was the only way you would ever be famous. Uh, fast forward to the time we, we started talking about Warholism, Fisher, Fisher Price released a toy. It was a karaoke machine that you hooked up to your TV, and instantly a two-year-old watched themselves on TV. And I started to think about that. What is the impact for marketing when it, what used to be a one-way conversation of, I tell you this, you go do this behavior, you buy this thing to make you feel this way has totally changed. You know, and we started to really realize that the relationship between a customer uh, and the company making the product for them was really fundamentally changing. Um, another trend we coined years ago was an idea called mass exclusivity. And it was the idea that we all could own the same product that needed to be customized to us. And so the iPod was one of the first products we saw that was a mass exclusive product. We all could own it and all have an individual experience. Again, really, really tough if you're a big marketer, right? We, we saw Nike really found a way to do it with Nike ID. You can customize your Nike sneakers, American Eagle or Levi's. You can go into the store, customize how you want your jeans ripped. But the idea that customers were having a bigger voice was something that was really emerging. Um, and one final trend I really loved coining was this idea we called cake baking. Uh, and it came about from a, a little known movie called Mr. and Mrs. Smith, right? And uh, what we all learned on that movie was that Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt fell in love, right? Um, and it was everywhere. And what was interesting is not a lot of people went to see the movie. You know, and so it, again, fundamentally changed marketing because what do we do? We talk a lot about a product and then we want you to go buy the product. What happens when the talk about the product becomes more fascinating than the product itself? You know, it's so marketing fundamentally has really, really changed a lot over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, so it's a classical marketer. There are four things that you need to know about marketing. First, I'll back up and say when we talk about marketing, 
Um, marketing is really everything that happens between you making your product and someone buying it. All of those activities in between really fall under marketing. Um, and then when we talk about marketing as a practice, there are really four areas we talk about. So product, place, promotion, and price. And so with product, there are some products where the actual creation of the product is in fact the marketing. So whether you see someone on Shark Tank and they make a magical sponge that does all of this, the actual product is what's talked about. It's, it's how the brand is marketed. It's built around this product. Uh, the concept of place. When I started in marketing, place was Macy's, Bloomingdale's. Um, Marshall Fields, and now place has really evolved to be your website, right? That's the first place people tend to experience a brand. And in, for many of these big retailers, especially those in consumer-driven businesses, it's still the number one place people are making purchases. You know, they may put a lot of money and resources behind the bricks and mortar locations, but quietly they'll tell you the number one place we're driving revenue is online. Um, when we talk about promotion, there are seven or several different areas. So promotion, we look at paid, unpaid, um, or earned, as we call it, and owned. And so again, your website is your own channel, your social feeds. Uh, when we talk about earned, it's really PR, right? Free media, what people say about your brand, what people in social media are saying about it. Uh, and then paid, which is advertising, a totally different part of the strategy. Uh, and then we know that price can be a really big part of marketing, right? So think about some of the direct-to-consumer brands. The biggest differentiator they talk about is by coming to us directly, we can charge you a lot less money, right? Price is really important. Or now it's even got its own category where it's called pricing transparency, right? We're going to be very transparent about what this actually costs. Uh, so in all of these classical areas for us, uh, product, place, promotion, price, they've all dramatically shifted. And the very definition of what those things mean has really changed. Um, and that's actually really great news for small business owners. You know, of, of all the companies I get to work with, um, I am most passionate and most excited to work with small business owners. I think that, you know, I remember when my team, uh, when we first discovered WordPress, and one of the things I thought for my smaller clients was, now we've democratized the market, right? We make it easier for people to find their customer and to talk to them and to have a product that's competitive and to have a web presence that speaks just like any other store. And so while it's created a lot of opportunity for small businesses, it's actually being very disruptive for big businesses. And so, you know, it's, it's a really interesting place right now. Uh, and so what I want to talk about is just from all the companies I've worked with, 10 things I've learned about marketing. And, and they're the 10 things that I think if you walk away with anything, a few of them I hope you think about as, as you start to create your own marketing. Uh, so the first thing I've learned is that all consumers are not created equal. Uh, I am definitely uh, a person who, who is known, I think my title that a magazine gave me is the Millennial Whisperer. Um, I grew up with millennials. I started studying them before they were millennials. I was literally in the right time, at the right place, and had tons of them that I was you know, talking to. And the one thing I can admit, I don't know if many of my colleagues will admit this, is that um, there was kind of this like millennial mania that we created, right? It's like, if you don't know them, your business will die, right? So we kind of like scared everyone so much that when they actually needed to pay attention to them, they were burnt out. They were like, I just don't even care anymore, right? It was like, millennials will do this. They'll kill your business. They're so big. There's, you have to do all these things. And the reality is now when the average millennial is what, 33, 34, you know, married, two kids, looking at buying property, now is a time where many businesses actually need to look at them. Um, but historically, we get very excited about new and emerging demographics. We scare people, and then we don't properly shift business in the way it needs to move forward. And so this is just an example of the way the, the really, I, I look, think about really big businesses look today. And so um, one of the biggest challenges businesses have right now is that for the first time in history, there are five generations of people who are working together in organizations. Uh, it's another reason why I think it's a great opportunity and a great time for small businesses. You know, if you are a Comcast or think of any large Fortune 500 company, you're dealing with the changes in consumer behavior, the changes in media options, how many different ways there are for people to find out about your product. And within your own company, the people that need to come together to make decisions are dealing with all of this stuff, right? We, we have, if you think about Gen X, right? I, I love Gen Xers, I, and any big company I've ever been in, Gen X is, really those are the people who keep everything together, right? They're managing up, they're managing down, they're just cool, they're keeping it together, like I just need this to get done, you know? 
Um, you have boomers who are, are renewed with energy. People in their 50s are, to me, the most interesting people to talk about right now. You know, that if you think about the advances in healthcare, they, they are younger than ever. They're more vibrant than ever. They actually do have some money, you know? And, you know, they're now trying to figure out the next stage of their life. I, there's a crisis within my friends of their parents not wanting to be grandparents because they're living their best lives right now, right? So they have abandoned the idea of being grandparents. You know, my mom just turned 60, and she's always, like, looking at a career change. I'm like, Mom, you're 60, and people are, like, hiring you for these? She's like, yeah, I think I'm going to diversify. I'm like, you know, so... There's a lot going on with boomers. There's Gen X saying, I wish you would just retire, all of you, because I need to move up, right? So you've got people stuck in their jobs, right? Then you've got like, <laughs> people like, get out. Then you have Gen Z, it's like, I'm so excited to be here. It's my first job. This is so awesome, a computer, you know? And then you have millennials, it's like, everything needs to change. Everything is wrong. When am I getting promoted? What's next for me? And this is going on internally, and we're not even dealing with the idea that we need to sell people stuff, right? So this is just what really makes me laugh these days. I'm like, this is what's happening. These are what big, and so when you look at the Warby Parkers of the world, you know, it's like, this is what we believe. This is our ethos. If you've ever been to Warby Parker, they all dress the same. They all talk the same. Everybody's on the same page, right? There's just a feeling of like, we're doing something really important and we're stylish and everybody's on, the, and you have these big companies. It's like, our, our, our board of directors won't retire and all the scandal are in the biggest companies ever, right? Like I, I was reading a headline yesterday about the Oscars and it's a really funny headline about Kevin Hart and it was just like, he totally screwed up. He wouldn't apologize. I was like, can we back up for one second? Who hired him? Did no one use a piece of technology to go through every single thing he's publicly said for his entire career to say, could anything be offensive? You know, it's like, I actually don't fault him for not apologizing. Who hired you, you know? Who actually made that decision? And one of my friends we were texting, she said, oh, it's probably just some, you know, older person that's like, he gets the kids excited, let's hire him, you know? And, and we'll get into the art and science part of marketing, but that's what's happening. It's, you know, there's so much information available that we're watching a lot of really big missteps. You know, we're watching a Pepsi commercial that's supposed to be about social activism, and the way you fix everything is Kendall Jenner just hands you a Pepsi, right? It's like, how does that happen? It happens because, like, all of this is going on. So, you know, I think when we think about consumers, when you think about your customer, you know, we'll talk a bit about not believing the hype, but really drill down to, like, what are the numbers saying? What does the data show? And how do I actually reach the people I'm trying to reach and, and not pay attention to the noise? A big part of my job is really filtering all day. What's real? What's noise? You know, what makes sense? Um, the second point is, you know, trends are cyclical. You know, I'm right now, we, we at my company study four, four tribes. We call them tribes of trendsetters, preppies, techies, alternatives, and independents. And uh, about Goodness, 15 years ago, I introduced this concept. I was doing some work for Verizon, and they said, we're going to launch a prepaid phone, and we're going to target a really cool person. I said, a cool person is not buying a prepaid phone. That's, like, not happening. Um, I said, actually, they were like, well, but we need them to launch it. I said, well, you know, there's this new tribe emerging, and they're techies, and they're like, but nobody, they're nerds. Nobody talks to them. I'm like, uh, no, actually, the world is changing, and these people, I predict, are going to be the coolest people ever, and they thought I was crazy. Uh, and then, like, a year ago, after that, Richard Branson launches, like, Virgin's prepaid phone. It was a Matrix phone. It was massively successful, and it actually did pay attention to that trend, and so... You know, I always love to study this tribe we call independence because they're very counterculture. And whatever they're doing, literally in a few years, will be the trend. You know, so there are people now who show up at retail stores to trade clothes, right? It's like they, there's, there's no currency that exchanges. They're just doing clothing swaps. You know, there, there are people who are, like, very dedicated to writing and handwriting letters now, right? So while we're all kind of like, oh, people aren't going to write again, there are people who are doing that. And, you know, like all trends, things come in and out of style. You know, one of the biggest trends is TV. You know, in my industry, people always talk about things are dead, right? It's like, oh, print is dead. I'm like, no, bad print is, and it should be, right? The problem with print is that people don't see themselves as brands. If print were dead, Chip and Joanna Gaines couldn't launch a magazine to millions of people. Why do we love them? Because, like, we see their kids, and I went to Waco, Texas, to go see what this was all about, right? And waited in line to buy a cupcake, you know? And the whole way, my friend's like, why are we going to Waco? It's like, no, we just have to be in this vibe, right? And they have, like, 500 people who are working for them. So clearly, print's not dead. 
bad print is dead. People who don't actually understand that brands are alive and vibrant, that's what's dying. Years ago, we were all told TV was dead, right? Now you're looking at who's nominated for Golden Globes and it reads a hol like literally it's like Hollywood's A-list is nominated in TV roles, right? And competing and fighting for TV. TV's never been more interesting and more exciting. And you know, one of the things we'll talk about in a bit is that you know, media just evolves, right? Now we're in the content business. If only Blockbuster had realized it was in the content business, right? You know, the fact that Blockbuster didn't become Netflix is a huge misstep. You know, that they didn't understand we just wanted to, to take content differently. You know, so people who are, you know, and we see it every day, they're hanging on to bricks and mortar, right? Like, no, we just have to, no. Like, sometimes you just gotta let it go and say, what's the next iteration of how we can make this better? Uh, so marketing is equal parts arts and science. I think this is the part of marketing that marketers struggle with the most. That's why you'll find creative agencies in market research shops. I happen to sit absolutely in the center of both. Um, I actually write a best-selling children's fiction series called Mackenzie Blue, and I would often say in that process, I was literally doing this to myself. Well, creatively, I want to do this. As a business person, this makes sense. When we created her uh, as a character, I literally went to moms and went to girls and said, okay, what can we do to get girls interested in science? What can we do about mean girl culture? And what came out of it was equal parts art and science. And a lot of times when we as marketers make mistakes, it's because we've gone too far in one direction and not informed by the other. Uh, and it is one of the only disciplines where you really do have to pay attention to art and science at the same time. I think direct-to-consumer brands do a really good job of this, but I also think that they're in a really troubled position right now because they happen to build their companies at a time where Facebook on you know ad revenue or Facebook ad machine was really also on an upswing, right? So now when we're having a bit of a correction, everyone's freaking out. And I'm saying, no, you guys just have to go back to understanding the fundamentals of the art and the science, right? Channels sometimes perform crazy good and you can't predict that that's gonna happen. But still as marketers, we have to understand our product, our place, our promotion, our price, always. You know, and if at any point, our algorithm is off, it's really because either we're not being creative enough or we don't deeply understand the consumer enough. That's what happened to a lot of companies who went millennial crazy. They just didn't pay attention to the fact that this group of 50-somethings was doing something really interesting, right? That their life was fundamentally changing in a way where they did have money. And it's always, I, I love talking to boomers, They're like, no one talks to me. I have tons of money to spend. No one cares to talk to me, you know, because we got so hyped up. But if we actually looked at numbers, we can see that trends were evolving. Um, I often talk about this a lot when I talk about the election. You know, the numbers were always there. It's just we didn't want to think about it. You know, five years ago, MTV did a really interesting study uh, from their public affairs department and talked about millennials as a generation. So, as 80 million people felt that the government, their government, was something that they actually had to overcome that they had to create solutions. So whether you think about Uber or Airbnb, it's like, well, we're gonna create the companies that actually handle the problems that we think are really big problems. And so, you know, thinking about an anti-establishment you know, establishment mindset going into elections, that exists. And so, you know, a lot of times we do, in fact, ignore data because it doesn't support what we wanna think. And, and we do that as marketers too. Marketers are people and we don't always look at data and say this is the very best decision we should make. Uh, don't believe the hype. Again, there's a lot of hype. And, and as marketers, it's, you know, and I'm sure you all hear it all the time. It's like SEO, SEM, it's dead, it's not working. It's like, well, you know, things evolve. Of course it's working. Are you actually putting the right things into it, right? Are you testing the right creative? Are you connecting with the audience in the right way? These are all tools. They're all tools that need to be properly utilized. Same with the website. You know the difference between a really good site that connects and a really bad site. You know, yesterday I had a really interesting experience. I was on Instagram and I got this like ad from this like, I think it was called like Women Executives in Heels. I was like, that's a really interesting name. Um, so I click on it and it's like, we have this journal. And I'm like, this is very pretty. I'm, okay, I'm gonna buy this. I can easily buy it with PayPal. Then I get an email and it's like, welcome to the community. This is all the things we do. This is our manifesto. And then I see like this really beautiful card. And it's like, if you buy 10 of them, you get 45% off. I've never seen this person before in my life and spent like a hundred bucks with them in less than an hour. And told my friends like, why didn't we create these cards? These cards are very cool, you know? It was just that this person somehow figured out that I was the target and that I was likely to buy from her. And then I went to see, well, she must be some very famous person. She had like 2,000 followers on Instagram. 
You know, it's like she just really seemed to get to the point of like, I'm going to ignore all this hype and just go through the funnel of saying, this is how I get to my target customer. Um, okay, so this is my favorite tip. Um, I did the majority of my research in airports. Uh, there are lots of people. They're all very different. Um, sometimes they're in like real hysteria, right? Um, there's a way that airports can get to your emotions that other experiences cannot. Um, and I also get to see a lot of people in different generations together. You know, airports, you know, an airport was where I realized getting on a plane that Uggs were really happening, right? And I look at things as a bell curve, right? Are we inching up the curve? Are we on the curve? Or is it like heading down? You know, it's the first place where I saw that Toms were like really a thing, right? Everybody has Toms on. Okay, this is a thing. You know, my latest airport trend, I'm a big fan of away luggage. I'm seeing more and more away roller bags, right? And so I'm always looking to see, like, what are people just doing when they're not trying to? Because none of us are really, like, trying at the airport, right? We're not, like, trying to be cool. We're not showing up in our best. We're just like, I got to get from here to here. You know, where are they eating? What are they looking at? What are they talking about? What are the pain points? You know, one of the biggest things as marketers that we should be trying to solve for is someone's pain point. You know, what's the actual problem that needs a solution? If you think about the founding story of Warby Parker. It's, I left my $700 glasses in a, play, in a you know, in a plane, and I didn't think I should pay $700 to have to replace them. And so, you know, airports, if you ever have a moment, when my students come to me with, with the companies they're gonna create in our program, I always say, go find a place to sit and just watch people. You know, it's fascinating to watch people, not constantly be in your mind thinking, I should do this, I should do that. Just sit down, have coffee, and see what people do, you know, when they're just in there. Are their suitcases not working? Are things not seeming to flow? Like, what's, what's the actual problem? And I'm sure if you take a minute to write, you'll find many problems that people need to fix. Um, consumers don't always know what they want. Uh, here's one thing I'm sure of. Consumers always know how they want to feel. Right? We all deeply know how we want to feel. Everything we put on, we do it because it makes us feel a certain way. It can make us feel smart. It can make us feel taken care of. It can make us feel comfortable. Uh, it can make us feel cool. But there is definitely a feeling assigned to it. We don't always know the product that fits that. And, and to me, one of the best examples of it has always been an iPad. Nobody knew they wanted an iPad until they had an iPad. Right? And now it's like, I, can't, I don't know what life would be like without my iPad. But until someone actually got up and said, I'm going to create this device for you, no one knew that they wanted. But all the feelings of feeling inspired and connected and entertained, I knew I wanted those feelings. Right, I just didn't know it had to be in that device. And sometimes as creators, especially as business owners, you're going to have to take a leap and say, I think people are going to want this product. But always base it on because they want to feel a certain way. right? And, and really focus and hone in on the feelings. Media channels don't die, they evolve. Um, one of the things I've said many times already that I hate to hear is this is dead, that is dead, this is over, this is done. You know, one of the greatest examples for me, uh, so think about podcasts now, right? But podcasts are so revolutionary, right? Or is it just like 60 years ago when people would, or maybe longer, uh, sit in their living rooms and turn on the radio and listen to the program of the evening, right? This isn't new. You know, we think about soap opera. A soap opera is literally the invention of Procter & Gamble, who created, you know, basically these long programs that were sponsored by soap. You know, if you look at the end of soap operas today, they're still produced by P&G Studios, you know. So things just evolve. We just do different things. And so it's always about the way that you connect to consumers. And I look at all of these as tools and channels to just really connect. And at the end of the day, you know, marketing is about a connection. It's about a feeling that makes you feel something you want to feel and then predicts a behavior that you're going to do. Uh, innovator, you're, you'll be replaced. Uh, we have a lot of brands right now that are in a place of really desperately needing to innovate. And I think one of the toughest things, sometimes I liken it to steering the Titanic, right, um, is that you see the writing on the wall for some of these businesses, right? But it's so big and it takes so long for the crash to finally happen. And then there are people who really become, first of all, what I said earlier, all of these people who have all of these complex problems and working together and then have to figure out what, what happens with the business. And what you start to find is maybe they buy up smaller companies to bring the innovation, right? You see Walmart did that with Jet.com, right? It's like come in and help innovate. Um, but a lot of times, you know, companies don't quite know what to do. And, and one of the biggest 
issues if you're a marketer today. It's, you know, I remember in the 90s when Gap would put their fall campaign on TV and everybody would run to Gap and we'd buy all the clothes, right? Then you fast forward 10 years, Gap changes the logo. People are like, that is ugly, and they change it back. That, that would never happen before, right? Marketing used to be like a megaphone. We tell you to go do this, and now consumers have a really big voice in what happens. They're, they're telling us 24-7 what they like or don't like. And I would say when I was a teenager, if I wanted to know if Jane Cosmetics tested on animals, what I would call an 800 number and, and ask them. You know, my youngest brother can go online, Google the information. If he doesn't like what he reads, he can start a petition on change.org. He can go on all of his channels, recruit his friends, make a video, and start a movement, right? So the amount of, of control and power consumers have is just unbelievably changed the way businesses have to deal with them. And so you know, this idea of innovation and how quickly it needs to happen is, is definitely one of the biggest challenges today. Uh, so another thing about great marketing, it always involves surprise and delight. You know, those are two most important words for marketers, su surprise, delight. You know, there are, there are other words, too, that talk about um, you know, ways we get people's attention. Shock and awe is another one. I'm sure we're all familiar with a very brilliant marketer who does a great job of shocking us every day. Um, and it doesn't always have to be great, right? It, it still elicits an emotion. And, and people align with that emotion, right? And, and, and whether we realize it or not, it's like, I wish I could say what I thought every day, right? How many of us deeply feel like we don't get to tell people how we feel every day, right? So sometimes the feeling of watching someone just say, I think you're stupid, you're like, I can't believe I aligned with like that feeling, right? I don't know where that's coming from that. I wish I could tell somebody that too. It could be my boss, it could be whoever. I wish I could just say, oh, you're really lazy, you know? Um, but with great marketing, you know, that's why people love Apple. There's just something surprising and exciting, you know. I always say to my team, they know, there's something for me that's just so deeply exciting when I see a new piece of creative or a new website or something that feels like magic, right? There's a bit of what you do and many of you do as developers I think is just pure magic when it's like there's an idea in my head that now is on the screen and people can connect in a different way. Uh, and great marketers know there always has to be surprise and delight and some unexpected element that feels a bit magical. Um, and finally, um, you must always have intrinsic and extrinsic value. I think one of the greatest examples of this is Weight Watchers. You know, just getting the app, it's like I did something for myself. Whether you track your points or not, it's just this internal feeling that says, I feel good because I made this decision to buy this product. People do it every day with the decisions, you know, and, and great marketers understand that both have to be there. There are things we buy, whether it's pine salt, whatever, it's like I'm buying it, but then like Meyer comes along, right, or Method, and it makes you feel good about the environment buying cleaning products, right? And so there are people who get fundamentally that, that having both of these elements is, is really important. And so you think about your marketing, you think about what you offer, really think about is there intrinsic and extrinsic value? You know, is there something people will feel internally, and is there an external exchange that people will also enjoy? Um, and that's it. I don't know how much time I have left. Eleven thirty. All right, folks, we definitely have some time for questions so that the live fo stream folks can hear what you're saying. Please use one of the two microphones in the aisles or raise your hand and I can bring the mic to you if you'd like me to. Just a quick reminder that uh, comments are great for Twitter. Not so much for right now. We're looking for questions. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name's Jason. I run operations for a web agency in, in San Antonio. I had a battle in my household growing up. I was an Apple guy. My dad's worked for Dell for 20 years. I come home with an iPod, and he'd tell me, you know, Dell has that too. And I always had some unspoken reason that I would always go for one brand over another. And then I just discovered Simon Sinek, and he talks about the why. And I felt like that was the unspoken value. Where does the why come into to your advice for a company? How does that, I mean, we, we can talk about price and product and location and all that, but, but how do you insert the why? Where in the process does that come? Uh, so I think that is a founding part of what you do, right, is that um, I think it's like the Jungian philosophy where you figure out there are 12 different personality types. And in our agency, we took on the personality of being the sage, right? So first is it goes back to the feeling. How do you want your clients to feel? There's some people that want their clients to feel taken care of. 
There are some people who want their clients to feel like they've come to the stage for, for advice to solve it. There are some people who want their clients to feel inspired. I would take a moment to really say, like, what's the intention? What's the intended outcome? You know, and for us, it's always the feeling of we want our clients to feel like they are bringing their toughest problem to a place that will absolutely solve it and do it in a way that's confidential and that really just produces what they're looking for. And so I think a lot of times when there are those issues, it's we're unsure of what the ethos is. And I think the problem with agencies, and I, you know, we're an agency, is sometimes you take the work that's coming and you allow so many outside influences to actually tell you who you are, right? So at a time where I would say, I love looking at emerging demographics, we got shoved in the millennial space. You know, while we do do influencer, we're not an influencer agency. We happen to create an influencer, you know, huge project for Oprah Winfrey Network, and then we really became the influencer people where it's like, really? We're this type of an agency. And so I think agencies often have the issue of your clients dictating who you become rather than very clearly up front saying, this is who we are and this is the type of business we want to attract. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Phil. I run IamNewsWatch.com, a publication for online marketers telling them new trends and things going on in the technical realm and regulatory realm as well as marketing realm. I'm interested in your perspective on what online marketers will be facing in the future that I need to reflect in my publication. Oh, it's my favorite thing to talk about right now. Um, here's the, the biggest issue, well, I would say challenge in the future, is the number of niche channels that marketers have to pay attention to. For so long, we've been able to just put something on TV, right? Just run a commercial on the Super Bowl. Just do this one big thing that has a huge impact. And I think in the future, we won't have that. You know, we're going to have hundreds of places that we need to be, you know? And I often use the example that before a teenager gets to school, they've seen 350 brand messages. Why would we ever want to do one thing, right? And so I think that the specificity and the number of people it will take for big companies to reach the 60, 70 million, 80 million people they used to do with one big thing can't happen anymore. And so I think they have to fundamentally shift how they're marketing. Um, the other thing I would say is it used to be that celebrities were really big influencers, right? And so now there's a trend we're calling nano influencers. It was micro influencers. And you know, I started my career with the belief that, you know, and it's a statistic that 81% of us make purchasing decisions based on what our friends say. You know, the idea of who a friend is has just changed. And so Again, when you look at the power and the place of influence, it, it really democratizes it. And so I think the challenge moving forward is actually for the bigger companies, because now they are forced to play in the same space as smaller, more startup companies, which I don't think we've seen before. Okay, thank you. A lot of us build websites for clients. Um, they have a value. Somebody's paying us. But how do we get to that next step where they are their extrinsic feeling about your website, how do you differentiate that? Because a lot of us have the same product, but what makes that special? Is it building community around, you had a website built by us, or is it, what is that? How do you do that for something that's a commodity, essentially? Uh, so the most, I always uh, tell my team, we can always make more money, we can never make more time, right? And so your biggest currency is the time it takes, right? And how quickly can a client get from concept to execution? You know, what's your process like? What makes you different than working with someone else? Um, do clients want to work collaboratively or do they want you to just do it? That really has to be defined up front and that's what starts to differentiate. It's really for the, how many thousands of agencies exist, right? And it comes down to um, how do you communicate to your client what the value is? You know, it's not as simple as we make a website. Like you said, many people do that. It, it's the process. What's your process? Like we at Buzz have a process we call connect brand, impact, understand. And as an agency, we always start with research and we end with research. That's our point of differentiation. So I often say to clients, if you are looking for the most creative shop in town, we are not it. That is not our strength. Our strength is in understanding upfront who the target customer is, how we need to really brand this, how we need to impact them, and then how we need to understand the whole process so we can do it again. And so you, know, you have to really develop that elevator pitch, you know, that few sentences that says, this is who we're about, and, and the client needs to get it. But there, a lot of it is just 
a workflow and communication too, and how you work with your clients. And I find, you know, all of our business really comes from other clients referring us, you know? And so it's really, again, sitting and saying, well, what's our process and being really clear on your own website, but this is how we work. And then we, we have something called the Buzz Report that comes out once a month. It's our trend newsletter. We've always put it out for free. And once a month, we're just in front of you know thousands of companies to say, here's something we're giving you for free, and it keeps us top of mind. So you should think about um, you know what's your version of that, that. That's just advice that you give that helps to educate people. Thank you. Hi, Tina. Um, I'm with an e-commerce store in the building materials industry, and we have a, a fairly complicated product. Um, we're a youthful brand. Can you think of any examples in the history of your business where you found a complex product that presented really well? Hmm, a complex, um, yes, we have several complex problems. Here's our products, rather. Here's what I always try to say to my clients, though. Um, can you say it in five words or less, even if it's really complicated? How do you drill it down to those five words? Sometimes it's an ex exercise for the internal team to get on the same page. Because even very complex um, things in my mind can be drilled down to five words. You know, and then, because what you're, the problem you then have if you can't do that is you both must educate the market on who you are and what you do. So you're playing the role of educator and you're now playing the role of salesman. And you really just, you know, I always say, you want to be a new lane in the highway, you never want to have to build the highway. That is the hardest job to do because how many times now do we do people say, we're the Uber of this, we're the Air, you know, we're the Warby of this, right? Because someone's already kind of blazed the trail. And so it is much easier to do the sales part when you don't have to do the educating part too. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, yes, I think I've got kind of a basic question, but you mentioned earned media versus paid or you know, all of those things. Um, I do all the marketing for a small women-run business, and as a small business, I totally see all the channels that I could be working, and so that's what I've been doing nonstop for two years. Last year, we had earned media with Fox Business, and this year, our big thing was we bought an ad in the Magnolia Journal, and the two behaved so differently, and so differently that I've been a little perplexed and a little discouraged. And so I wonder just, like, to a small business, what are the, where are the best channels that you encourage small businesses to really put all of their um, effort, and what are some ways that are, like, some tips for that you can get earned more earned media, which might be a really, like, so not a simple question. So was it that Magnolia question. didn't perform the way you thought it was going to? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would anticipate that. Um, so I think it's really important. So are, are you a direct-to-consumer? Are you selling to consumers? Yes, Okay. e-commerce. Um, so if you're an e-com business, the most important thing is to look at customer segmentation. It's a big part of what we do, right? So are we talking to healthy moms? Are we talking to athletic dads? Um, you know, I once had a client that told me they were going to make Mentrist a thing. It was like Pinterest for men, and I was like, that's never going to be a thing. Like, you should never do that. Like that, The behavior is not even there. Do not waste your effort, right? Um, and there, there are times where we see, we get really excited about a channel like Magnolia, right? Magnolia is a great place for them to market their own stuff, right? And it's a Martha Stewart model, right? It's like, I sell all of these products and I'm gonna tell you, and who are the people that buy ads? People who are selling all of those products, right? So what you really wanted was to be in Joanna's Things, right? Her top 10 things of the month. Um, and it's just that, the, and that leads to the surprise and delight for the customer. So to have, think about the businesses that you're competing against in that space wouldn't have made sense versus being on TV or a place where people hear your brand, you know, they see you, they can immediately connect with you. So you have to think about, number one, just three different types of customers you're serving, and then I would name them, right? So with many of my customers were like, she's Molly, Molly is 41, she's, you know, we had a client who was spending tons of money on radio and wanted to get out of radio, and we realized, like, your customer is actually a soccer mom who spends 4.5 hours a day in her car. So the best place for you to be advertising is actually on radio. So you have to get a little, like, kind of drill down on the activity of the person and then let that inform the channels. Don't think just because a channel is awesome, it's going to be awesome for you. You know, and then once you realize, you know, what channels work, you'll be able to double down on that a bit more. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, first, thank you, Tina. Um, one of the things, and I guess as a professional uh, web developer and as a digital brand strategist, I'm running into the clients who they know what their 
they know what their demographics, they know who their audience is, and they kind of know what they want branded, but then we'll kind of do some research and say, maybe you should kind of cater toward this way. And they're like, eh, I still want to do it this way. Um, so how do you kind of deal with those? Do you decide, okay, client wins, they're paying me, I'm going to just do it their way? Or do you find a middle road? Or do you just say, I'm not doing it, period. I don't care what you say. Uh, I try to find the middle ground and always say we're going to do 50% of what you've done before and we're going to experiment with 50%. Because the problem is, um, you know, if you like work with any big company, you're looking at last year's budget, right? This is what happened last year. And we only think we're going to have this kind of variance. And so people have gotten very comfortable with what they know. What we know as practitioners is that every single day something is changing. The business you were in a year ago is not the business you're in now. But what happens at these companies, right? We go back to that initial funnel. All of this internal drama is going on, right? And it's like, we just got to stick to what we know. And so then when you as the agency don't perform, it's like, well, it's your fault. You didn't know. And clearly, the research maybe that this plan is built on is a year old at this point, once it's gone through all the meetings and all the approvals of all the people that say yes to this plan. And so I think you'll find that that's going to shift. And I, I say it's, it's going to shift because it has to when it becomes a revenue problem, right? When, when the ability to not be quicker or be at the speed of the market changes the business, that's when the business will fundamentally make a change. And so I would challenge you to say, okay, can we do it 50% your way, 50% ours? Not, can we do it 75% your way, 25% ours? And let's see who performs better, and then we'll iterate from there. Right, thank you. Okay. This will be our last question. Uh, so my name's Jonathan. I have uh, an agency just down the road here in the Nashville area that employs one person, and that's me. And I imagine there's a lot of people in the room that are that way. So you've get, given some awesome tips about how we can create better messages. And that's good for me because I'm my own marketing team. Uh, but one question I have is more along the lines of the best way to get the message out there mm -hmm. because I can't afford a Super Bowl commercial. I can't even really afford a radio spot. Uh, so I've done a lot of Facebook ads. I'm looking into doing more with Google ads and stuff like that. But I'm curious if you have any other ideas for an affordable means of marketing. I get pretty much all my clients through referrals and I'm looking to try to grow beyond that because uh, referrals are awesome, but I want to do more than just the network of the people I've worked with. So what tips would you have in that area? Sure. So when I started out, um, I did a lot of writing. I, I actually have a degree in journalism, not in marketing. And so I wrote, I wrote quite a bit, um, lots of opinions and for very random places like retail merchandise or magazine. And so I would say to all of you in, in that space, first of all, like thought leadership is really important. Uh, and that means you have to take a moment to actually say, what do I believe? What do I fundamentally believe is true about the work I'm doing, the industry I'm in, and how do you become that person? So it means being on LinkedIn and, and be consistent. If you can't write something once a week, don't be sporadic and like for a while write once a week and then you don't show up for months, right? If all you can commit to is once a month, you're gonna have a really great piece of content, do that. Once a month, have a really good piece of content. Know exactly who your audience is. And so make sure you're curating those spaces. Um, you know, it can be on LinkedIn where, you know, I have friends who are massive LinkedIn influencers. I have a friend who does a show from his iPhone for a minute. It's like one minute with him talking about a marketing thing. And so I would figure out what the thing is that you're known for. Uh, if you don't know, I would go back to your last five clients and say, why did you hire me? What was it that differentiated me? And then take that and, and try to make it a platform. And then engage on the medium that makes the most sense for you. So if you are an Instagram, if you are not good with Instagram, if you don't take great compelling photos, don't go on Instagram. Like just don't do that, it doesn't help you. And then your clients are gonna be like, I don't want that. You know, Most of all, I have clients that come to me that say, I want my newsletter to look like your newsletter. You know, I want you to give me something that looks at that. So I would think about what are you best at, do that. If you have a great voice, be on podcasts. You know, create a podcast and, and don't try to do too many things. I would master one thing, let that start to create a return for you and then move on to the next thing. Give her one more round of applause, folks.